Well, what happens when you remove oil, coal, natural gas from our energy production? Uh, could it be a man-made catastrophe, maybe a suicide, forcing us into unreliable solar and wind? Uh, we're about to find out now that the Biden administration instituted new rules to basically remove coal-powered plants, natural gas production inside the United States. A few weeks ago, of course, they now banned, with the help of Congress, getting enriched uranium from Russia. They've depleted our strategic oil reserves. Um, last week, the Biden administration announced they're depleting our northeastern strategic oil reserve. So this seems like madness right now. Someone who's been sounding the alarm on the need for fossil fuels is author Alex Epstein. He's a great writer, a great thinker that we need to be paying attention to. His books are Fossil Future, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. And after reading his books, I said we have to have Alex on the show to shine a light on this story and provide some sanity in the sea of craziness right now. So Alex, welcome to Redacted. Good to see you. Yeah, my pleasure. Good to see you. Well, I have to say your works are, I'm a big fan of your your works um, and really, really shot a lightning bolt through my brain uh, and shattering a lot of the myths and narratives that we've been, you know, uh, foisted upon for so many years, the propaganda. Um, and you're here, Alex, at an interesting moment because the Biden administration, is, as you've just written about in your Substack, rolls out these new EPA rules. Um and we can get into the, the details of it here, and I'd love for you to do that. But it sounds to me like energy suicide for the United States. We're shooting ourselves in the foot. Do you disagree? How do you see it? Yeah, I mean, I see this particular thing as incredibly bad. And then it's it's part of a campaign that's that's much worse. So just to put it in broader context, the animating goal of U.S. energy policy right now is what's called net zero by 2050 which means no CO2 emissions, no more broadly what are called greenhouse gas emissions on net. So you can't add any CO2 to the atmosphere by 2050, which in practice means the rapid elimination of fossil fuel use. Some people think you can capture all the CO2, so you can just keep using fossil fuels the same way and capture it. That's completely not cost effective at scale. So net zero means rapid elimination of fossil fuels. And the Biden administration you know, has signed the Paris Agreement, which it definitely shouldn't have done. It totally violates the Constitution to sign a treaty and not get Senate ratification. But it's committed us to this, much like many others, many other countries have committed to this to this goal, some less sincerely, some, some more sincerely. Um, but this goal means in practice that you have to shut down the vast majority of American energy. And one of the key problem areas we have in energy already is the electric grid because the electric grid is the you know the basis of so much of modern life we, we you know we had a few years ago blackouts in california you know our experience with that was just being shut down a day is a disaster and yet we already have shortfalls around the country that we haven't had in decades uh we're already having that and what the biden administration is doing because it's so dogmatically committed to net zero by 2050 is it's it's passing rules that will shut down basically every coal plant in America, as well as prevent most new natural gas plants from coming online. So you're you're talking about shutting down almost 20% of our reliable capacity, and then having the inability to replace it with the most viable replacement, which is natural gas. So they're basically, and this is in an environment where thanks to EVs, thanks to AI, we're having rapid increase in demand. So it's, it's almost impossible to believe that we're artificially reducing the supply of electricity and artificially increasing demand for electricity, which is just a guaranteed disaster, yet that's what we're doing in the name of net zero dogma. And you could understand it if it was a natural disaster or something. There was some ca you know, catastrophe that unfolded. You had a Pompeii moment and it's wiping mm -hmm. out all sorts of, you know, power stations and substations and everything else. But it's not. It's it's literally all coming out of Washington, D.C. Yeah, I mean, there, there's nothing conceivable that could happen in terms of weather that could do anything like what's planned. I mean, there's no, you know, no such thing as a nationwide storm in a modern economy that just shuts down the entire grid indefinitely. And it's it's just I mean, but of course, what they would say is, well, we're actually helping you. Because even if you have to go without as much electricity, I mean, they would minimize the damage on that end, but they say, well, we're saving you from climate change, as they call it. It's an existential threat. And the idea is if we don't do this, then the weather is just going to punish us so much, it'll be even worse 
than having shortages of power, which we could talk about, but my view is the exact opposite. The catastrophe is lack of energy, not some kind of change in climate. When you have abundant energy, you can deal with basically any climate. When you have scarce energy, you can't deal with any climate or anything else in life. You write about in your book, Fossil Future, I have some notes here. You said, we're being told that intermittent solar and wind, which provide just 3% of the world's energy after many decades on the market, which would today depend on fossil fuels for 27 or 24 seven backup, will definitely be able to replace 80% of energy we get from fossil fuels, plus provide most of the additional energy the world needs in less than 30 years. I mean, when I read that, I think, yeah, that sounds absolutely reasonable. There's no way we can pull this off. What models are they using that says that this is smart? We can shut down coal power. We can then not not create new natural gas production. And we can replace all of this with solar and wind. Where are they getting this information? Well, I think one important thing to, to assess is, are the people saying this really interested in abundant energy and they just think they've come up with a better way? Or are they looking for an excuse to do what they want to do? And I think it's definitely the the, the second category. Because think about it: if you're obsessed with abundant energy, um, you would look at what are, what's the proven track record of different ways of creating energy abundance. And as the the quote you uh, read indicated, solar and wind do not have an impressive track record, and they have the very unimpressive fundamentals of being intermittent. So basically unreliable. And the key is uncontrollable. So the whole modern world depends on controllable energy where you control when you use energy and crucially you control the exact amount that you use. What percentage of the time do solar and wind give you the exact amount of energy you need? 0% of the time. They never give you exactly what you need. So our whole economy is built on this controllable phenomenon. These are uncontrollable. And the only way that just using solar and wind you could get around this is if man-made storage was just so incredibly cheap, you could basically just build infinite amounts of storage. Then you would build a huge amount of intermittent stuff and you'd sort of charge batteries for days, uh, weeks, months on end, right? To deal with summer and to deal, like, deal with winter and deal with, you know, depending on where you are, where the shortfalls are. But man-made storage is incredibly expensive and this is well known. So e Elon Musk, who is sometimes good on these issues, sometimes not, in this case, not, you know, he'll claim, well, my mega packs and solar panels can power the whole world. But if you go on his website and you put in a day's worth of energy, which you'd want way more of that as a backup, you're talking about $200 trillion for a day's worth of energy. Yeah. So it's just totally insane. That's double global GDP. So it's just these, the people, I mean, we could go into their different claims and, and, um, if people go on a, a, a web, free website called energytalkingpoints.com, if you search for net zero, we have like refutations of every argument for net zero, including every one of these and all the stuff on solar wind. But the bottom line is there's no evidence at all that this can replace fossil fuels. It's just kind of hand waving by people whose real obsession is eliminating CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. But they're not willing to say if we eliminate CO2 emissions or even go a significant of the way, a part of the way there, we're going to have massive suffering. So they're claiming, oh, we can get rid of fossil fuels and have energy abundance. And that's always been a lie, which I've been pointing out for the last 17 years. Now the world is waking up to that because they're seeing that these green policies lead toward energy scarcity. And we're just a tiny fraction of the way to where they want to go. So people are waking up and I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that's happening. There seem to be some case studies, at least, on how this would go if the Biden administration moves forward with this plan, which it seems like they are, eliminating coal plants, shutting down natural gas production, uh, and so forth, and moving towards solar and wind. You can look to certain countries, I believe, like Ghana, for instance, that under the pressure from the World Bank said, yes, we'll, we'll move in this direction. And now they have widespread blackouts on a regular basis. Um, it's been devastating. And uh, do you can you speak to some other case studies that maybe are a, a cautionary tale for where the United States might go if we go down this dark path? Definitely. But it's important that all the case studies are very marginal because nobody has come. The most important case study is nobody has done remotely what they're advocating uh, at all. So no, nobody is oh, powering because, themselves. Because like Germany was a lot of yeah. talk in that regard recently, right? We saw... Mm -hmm after the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline. And of course, they pull, you know, pull all these nuclear power plants offline. 
sort of shift back right. to goal. So I think they've taken steps and then they they step back and realize, oh, all of our all of these companies are now shutting down because they can't afford the power here. So maybe we should change direction. Is that what you mean? That's that's part of it. But even when they were going more whole hog in the direction, they're just powering still, you know, far less than 50 percent of their grid with solar and wind. They're doing it by being dependent on neighbors and stuff like that. So they're they're relying on the reliable electricity of neighbors. This almost always happens when you're dealing with unreliable stuff. Like Denmark, people say, oh, they use so much wind. Yeah, because it's a tiny country that's sandwiched between these other places where when they produce too much wind electricity, because it's always too much or too little. It's never, the, it's never Goldilocks, right? So when they produce too much, they can offload it. When they produce too little, they can bring it. But they're always parasites on the people who are producing the reliable controllable electricity. And also this is only for electricity. Electricity is just 20% of the world's energy use. Most of the world's energy use is directly burning fossil fuels, either for transportation, where it's often the only option, like for planes and uh, container ships and that kind of thing, or for heat, like industrial heat and residential heat is often way cheaper to do by burning fossil fuels directly than with any form of electricity. So they can't even replace fossil fuels for electricity, let alone all the non-electricity uses and as I said before, marginally when they try, the more they try to remove the fossil fuel with unreliable solar and wind, the more they have electricity costs going up, the more they have electricity shortages. So if you're doing, if you're advocating something that has never been done because it's impossible to do in any, without killing yourself and moving in that direction is deadly, why would you then commit the United States to doing that? You know something is toxic in small doses, has never been done in large doses, why would you advocate a large dose? Do you think the United States is heading for a disaster as it relates to our overall grid and production right now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if, if, if what the Biden administration has just passed, if that doesn't get stopped or reversed, and so there are a few paths toward that there, are, you know, you could have a diff different administration, you could have, um, you know, legal challenges, because a lot of stuff they passed, I think even at this point, they know it won't survive in court, but they can still by passing it, they kind of scare the market and move it in the way uh, that they want. There was a recent SEC climate, uh, what's called climate disclosure rule that's in that's in this category. But yeah, it's kind of like they're, in some sense, I think the people in the know are counting on it not happening, which is really scary. They're passing rules that many people within the administration know that if those rules continued unabated, it would crater the grid. But that's not a, but they figure, oh, well, somebody's going to challenge us and it won't be as bad or people will temper our rules. But what they're advocating, like I'm, I take people seriously. So if you advocate something that taken literally will destroy the grid, I think that's a terrible idea and people should speak up about it. You've talked about, I believe you've written extensively about how devastating it is. You know, we talk about this idea of warming, right? And of course, they're all tying this argument around this idea that it'll bring mass death and destruction, this, this slight warming of the earth. But of course, you're pointing out without fossil fuels, without the ability to heat our homes, the cold is far more devastating than any little amount of heating uh, would happen on the earth. Can you talk about some of the examples? I know in your book, you one really stuck out to me. And I remember as I was reading this, I just, I said, Natalie, you got to come here. You got to hear this. And when you talked about uh, the you know children's wards at hospitals um, being being powered by fossil fuels, not being able to uh, have children, not being able to bring uh, children into this world in in maternity wards as a result, or even being able to do simple things um, with the different medical equipment to check on the health of the baby, powered by fossil fuels. We take all of these things, I think, for granted. And we realize we don't realize that. It's, it's a matter of life and death for, for so many people. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think the thing that unites all of these things is the recognition that unimpacted nature is very inhospitable to humans. A, a lot of the mindset behind, you know, we're going to ruin the climate, warming must be bad, it must be catastrophic, is the idea that non-human nature is this perfect nurturing environment for us. And what we have to be afraid of is disrupting it. But in fact, human survival and flourishing, so living to our highest potential, uh, requires radically disrupting non-human nature. And so, you know, the example you gave, which is, is very even closer to my heart right now, because we're having our first child in a month, 
and I've been thinking about this, you know, when you think about the risk of premature birth, I mean, fortunately, we're, we're more or less past this now, but you know, millions don't get past it. You have a premature birth. And in the United States, in most cases, you don't have to be that worried because you know you have things like incubators. But an incubator is just a magical thing that doesn't exist in nature. And it doesn't even exist within humans' physical capabilities. It's something very artificial in the best sense of the term. We have to create a machine that can nurture a child, uh, you know, a premature baby uh, to health. And we have that, we take that for granted, but that depends on a modern high energy economy. And most directly, it depends on reliable electricity. So I tell a story about a baby in the Gambia, so an African nation, where they don't have incubators in the hospital because they don't have reliable electricity, which you need for incubators. So what happens is you have a premature baby, the same kind of baby that in the United States, you wouldn't even know had a problem, right? I mean, I've had friends who've had premature babies and there are challenges, but they, you know, one of my friends had a premature baby and like they take the baby via helicopter to one place to another and have even better incubators and NICUs and this kind of thing. But this is just you know, it's over, right? You, I mean, the baby just dies and there's nothing anyone can do about it. And you just think that's just a microcosm of, of what, you know, how inhospitable the world is absent technology and in particular machines. And the key to using machines is energy. And so this, this goes to climate as well, is when you think of climate, you can't think of it as it was super hospitable and then we we have to worry about not changing it. No, the main thing we need to recognize is it's super inhospitable and we need to master it. So you mentioned cold, cold related deaths still far exceed heat related deaths. So in general, all things being equal, warming is better, particularly because it takes place nearer to the poles, takes place more at night, uh, takes place more in the winter. So warming tends to be benign. Most civilizations, you know, they talk about optimums historically as warm periods. So the fear of warming, thermophobia, you could call it, that itself is, is really questionable. But then if you recognize, well, any warming we're causing with fossil fuel use is a byproduct of mass availability of energy. And mass availability of energy allows us to master climate, not just heat, not just uh, heat us when it's cold, but cool us when it's hot, irrigate us when there's drought, which is a huge saver of you know, millions and millions of, uh, of lives almost per year, um, fight, you know, build sturdy buildings and storm warning systems, deal with storms, et cetera. So this, this high energy world that we can only have for the foreseeable future, not forever, but for the foreseeable future using fossil fuels, that's the thing. If that's the thing driving the warming, isn't the warming an amazingly low price to pay, particularly because it has some benefits. And if you do any kind of cost benefit analysis, it should be obvious that fossil fuels are the most miraculous thing ever, and yet they're treated as as poison. And, and it's interesting to think about why, but that is what's happening. You mentioned some of the, at the top of the show, you mentioned AI, you know, artificial intelligence, the massive amounts of power consumption that will be required with these massive server farms and, and processing that will be required. You also, of course, talk about, and you've written it quite extensively about, we've covered on our show quite extensively, of course, Biden's EV mandate and pushing the nation towards electric vehicles. We've seen the disaster in Canada. I've been covering that side of the story as well, when you have all of these frozen trucks that can't operate in, in Canada. Um, the energy demands for EVs, can you talk about that? How will the United States given their numbers, where they want to get to, how do we expect to be able to, to power all of these EVs? And can you talk about maybe the canard behind the idea that these EVs are somehow powered magically? <laughs> At the end of the day, they still need fossil fuels to power the electricity that's powering the EVs. Am I wrong? Yeah, in practice, you do need, need fossil fuels. And I would just put this in the context of we already have nationwide electricity shortages. And if we'll, we're going to focus on EVs, we already have organic demand from AI, you know, data centers computing more broadly. Like this is a very, and it's a very fast phenomenon. Like usually increases in electricity demand are kind of slow. And over time, I mean, this is, you have companies talking about, we're going to add new data centers the next six months, next 12 months, next 18 months. So this is an existential risk to our grid absent, absent EVs, right? 
And at the same time, as we've been talking about, the government is artificially reducing the supply of reliable electricity. So it's not saying, hey, let's build out more electricity. Let's have more new natural gas plants, coal plants, nuclear plants, et cetera. It's just trying to build out unreliable solar and wind, which by the way, it can't even do at the rate it wants to do in part because the green movement opposes all forms of development. So it's just hard to build anything. So what you have is we're having shortfalls of electricity. We're trying to make the shortfalls worse and then we're increasing demand. There's increasing demand already organically. And then with EVs, they're trying to create the greatest increase in demand imaginable because what they're doing is they're taking our automobiles and other vehicles and, and making those electric. And what people might not realize is your automobile, EV owners might realize this, but your automobile is just an enormous, enormous power consumer compared to the electronics at your house. Like you're, you're just cars use so much energy. You think about they're moving thousands of pounds. They're moving us. They're going fast. There's nothing like this in our homes. So you're talking about what, like 25% plus increases in demand on a grid that can't handle existing demand. And once again, I, I would point to the people advocating this, I do not believe are genuinely interested in more abundant and better energy in any way. I think they're obsessed with this idea of reducing our emissions at all costs. They don't really care about energy and thus they don't think through these obvious, these obvious and mounting consequences. And it's crazy. We're building a new studio. And uh, as we were talking with the electric company about power for the new building and all of this in the next couple of uh, weeks, they offered us, this is unbelievable, they offered us to, uh, we'll, they'll put some sort of a governor, some sort of a device. We'll come out to your location and we'll put this like device where intermittently throughout the day, we'll just shut off your, your air conditioning, we'll shut off the power to your house for 15 minutes and it'll happen kind of randomly um, throughout the day, but it'll be in 15 minute increments, but we'll put a $30 credit on your bill every month. And my wife was setting this up and she about hit the floor. She just, you know, she was like, you know, is Klaus Schwab running your organization? No, absolutely not. We're not doing that. We could be in the middle of, of a live broadcast and they'll just shut the power off uh, because they said we, our grid is taxed and we this is a way to mitigate, mitigate that. So, I mean, this is already happening and they're looking for all these bizarre sort of creative ways during peak hours to try to limit power consumption. Yeah, and often this goes under the euphemism of smart grid. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, we need, you know, the grid is terrible. We need to fix the grid. Uh, but their view, they're not trying to fix the grid in a way that'll make it have way more abundant and affordable and reliable electricity. They're trying to fix it to somehow get mass amounts of solar and wind to work. And what we're finding out is if you want to get anywhere near that, what you have to do is create energy scarcity on demand. Because if, if you can't control the electricity, then you have to control the people using the electricity. So we're going back to the days where we are controlled by the weather, right? Our whole lives, like we used to, we used to live in a climate emergency to use the modern term in the sense of climate just determined everything about our lives. It determined our harvest. It determined whether we lived in terms of storms, right? It could make us incredibly uncomfortable. And then we mastered that largely by using huge amounts of energy to get machines to be incredibly productive and resilient. And now they're bringing us back and they're saying, oh, if you want to use those machines, you can only use them if the sun is shining or the wind is, is blowing. And I think this will wake people up because they've been told in the past, get off fossil fuels and you'll get rich. And now they're seeing get off fossil fuels a little bit and you'll get poor. And people are are waking up to that and they're saying, wait, this is this is not what I signed up for. Do you worry, we've been really focused on this here on the show, the idea of the your, your sort of carbon footprint, your social credit score, the move towards you know a central bank digital currency, CBDC, moving away from the US dollar, which is coming um, as a currency, as a as a cash form, uh, you know, a cash in the United States. They're already doing it in Europe, of course. So this is coming to the United States, how quickly it will get here. It's anyone's guess. But the idea that you'll have an app, a FedNow app, you know, from the from the Fed, Federal Reserve, and it will monitor your, your spending habits. It'll monitor your carbon footprint. It'll monitor and track all of that. And it will limit your ability to travel to, you've already, you've already exceeded this month, Alex, you're, your travel capacity because you you flew twice this 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 month so mm -hmm. you can't you can't call an uber are you worried about this or does this sound 
I mean, does this sound like something out of 1984? Uh, I mean, but we're already seeing it. So I, I, I don't want to say that this yeah, is not coming. Yeah, I am to me, worried it, to and me it does sound happening. like something. Yeah, and I think the, the thing to watch out for is when people, and unfortunately both Democrats and Republicans are advocating this in, mm -hmm. in various forms, is when they talk about, oh, we just want to measure it, right? right. We just want to collect information. And my view is the government does not have the right to any information that it wants. And in fact, you need to be very careful about what kinds of information the government gets. I mean, basically the government should get information that's relevant to protecting our rights. Now, what they're arguing is that while well, emitting CO2 violates everyone's rights and therefore we get to track it. But they're like, we're just gonna track it. Sometimes the Republicans will buy on because they'll say, oh, we wanna track what's happening in China because we wanna impose some tariff on it based on GHG emissions, blah, 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 blah. But what they're doing is setting up a regime where the government has what it views as very precise and actionable information uh, on something that it is trying to reduce. So if you square this with, it collects information, it has control over us, and it has a goal of getting rid of these emissions by 2050, what else is it gonna do? It's certainly gonna do it you know, at the corporate level, right? And it's gonna do, it's gonna at least start imposing fines. So yeah, it's a very totalitarian type thing and people should be very worried about it. You talk quite a bit about anti-human, uh, anti-humanism in your, in your books. And I, I was really struck by that because most of these policies that you talk about really are anti-human at the heart of it. Um, you talk about how we must think critically about the method and evaluations um, that we're using to arrive at certain policies. And often you say there are two major ways in which our knowledge systems method of evaluation can go wrong, at, often uh, catastrophically wrong, which may be how we started off tonight's show talking about what the EPA is doing right now. Um, and you say we must be constantly vigilant for this. One, using an anti-human standard of evaluation. And number two, failing to fully understand the full context. And that seems to me what's driving almost all of this climate hysteria policy right now. It's anti-human. And it's also failing to understand the full context, the full, full historical context of weather patterns um, and, and history of the planet. I'm glad you, you quoted that portion. That's from chapter one of the book, which I think anyone can read for free online. But, but I think one of the things it brings out is the book is very focused on thinking methods. So instead of just jumping in and saying, hey, here are my thoughts, I'm stepping back and saying, hey, I have philosophy background. So, hey, how should we think about this issue? And then underlying that is what are our assumptions about the world and what are our values? And, and you mentioned the issue of a standard of evaluation. So this means when we're evaluating what to do about something, how are we measuring good and bad? And so let's take this with the earth. We're talking about, you know, we want a better earth, right? And I would ask, what standard are you using? Are you evaluating it by the standard of, I want to advance human flourishing on earth, so I want the earth to be the best possible place for human life, or I want to minimize or eliminate human impact on earth? And if right. you think about it th this way, it's pretty clear that the climate movement is very focused on eliminating human impact on earth, in particular climate impact, CO2 emissions, but also other forms of impact. You'll hear them say things like, we have too many people, right? Just enough of us, right. just enough of me, way too much of you, as P.J. O'Rourke once, uh, once put it. Like Michael <laughs> Mann, one of the leading climate activists says, we need 1 billion people, not 8 billion. Well, like you're not viewing the earth from a human perspective. And it's very important when you're taking advice to know what the person's standard is. As, as a great economist, George Reisman once put it, trusting one of these um, impact haters, a scientist impact hater who hates human impact with recommendations is like trusting a doctor who's on the side of the germs. So if you're not on team human, even if you know science, that doesn't assure me because you're viewing science from an anti-human perspective. And you see this with climate. A lot of the people in climate, they have this view that the number one goal should be to not impact climate. Well, if that's your number one goal, that means you don't care about energy, you don't care about prosperity, you just care about us not impacting climate. And I think that whole frame is guiding the whole world, that we're, the whole world is obsessed with not creating mass prosperity by 2050, not by creating mass energy abundance by 2050, not creating global human freedom by 2050, but by eliminating any impact on climate by 2050. That makes no sense as a goal. It's an anti-human goal, because all it's saying is the only thing we care about is no human impact. And in practice, it leads to human uh, destruction. So that's, that's the number one point of my work, is you need to decide 
are you in favor of advancing human flourishing on earth or eliminating human impact on earth? And that will shape every decision that you make. What did you think when they rolled out that doomsday clock that King Charles, I think, unveiled and pressed the button to start that doomsday clock a few months ago uh, to let everyone know, like, this is the specific date when the world ends unless we... What, what was the date? What was the date? I think it's like seven years away. or It's it's very close. Like, you better you better get prepared. Did he, right. did he actually do this or did somebody do it on his behalf? Uh, he doesn't. Yeah. He's very much, of course, you know, he's m very much uh, oh, oh, yeah. yeah, anti-human. No, he, he's totally... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about these doomsday predictions, and, and I talk about this in, in chapter two of Fossil Future, is that there's just this incredibly terrible track record of what I call designated experts. So people that our institutions tell us are the experts that we should listen to. They have this terrible track record of predicting catastrophe or apocalypse, and then the world gets better. So they did this with resources, right? We're going to run out of resources. Paul Ehrlich, you know, still a famous Stanford ecologist. We're going to run out of resources. Now we have more usable resources than ever. We're going to pollute our environment so we can't even see the sun. You know, our environment gets cleaner and cleaner. We're going to die from catastrophic global cooling. Then we're going to die from catastrophic global warming, climate-related disaster deaths. So deaths from storms and floods, extreme heat, et cetera. Those going down the, at, you know, at all-time lows right now. So, right. and then nuclear, you know, nuclear energy was, oh, this is going to kill everyone. And in fact, it's been the safest form of energy ever, ever devised. So when you see this kind of track record, at minimum, you need to be skeptical when they make a new doomsday prediction. And yet you see there's not that much skepticism. And in, in, in Fossil Future, I talk about sort of the underlying causes of these doomsday things. And one thing I'll just say is this view, I call it the delicate nurture assumption of Earth. So it's the idea that that Earth, unimpacted by humans, exists in this balance that nurtures us. And the balance is stable, so it doesn't change too much. It's safe, so it won't endanger us too much. And it's sufficient. It gives us enough resources as long as we're not too greedy. And this is like King Charles's and many other people's view of the Earth and the climate, right? It's this delicate nurture. And human impact is just this force for evil. Human beings are parasite polluters. So all we do is we take from nature and we ruin nature. So that that's their view. And if you have this view, you'll always expect significant human impact to lead to disaster. So you'll think, oh, if we're burning fossil fuels, it's got to lead to disaster, right? If we're using a lot of resources, it's got to lead to disaster. But it's a false view of the earth because in fact, nature is not this delicate nurture. It's wild, I call wild potential. So it's not, it's not stable, it's dynamic. It's not safe, it's dangerous, and it's not sufficient, it's deficient. That's why life was terrible for the average person until basically we figured out fossil fuels and freedom. And human beings are not parasite polluters. We're actually producers. So we add more value to the world. We've created a lot more resources and we're improvers. We actually clean up our environment, including making things like clean water from dirty water and we make we neutralize climate danger. So if you have this false model of earth like like King Charles and so many others do, you always expect modern civilization to lead to its own destruction, much like Marx expected capitalism to lead to its own destruction. That's, by the way, where we get the idea of sustainability, which is a very corrupt term, because it implies that capitalism and freedom are inherently unsustainable. And so we need government control to make us, ourselves live a quote, sustainable life. But in reality, capitalism and freedom are better than sustainable. They're progressive in the proper sense of the term. They're evolving. They, we, we figure out more and more ways to get new resources all the time. Aluminum used to be useless. Now it's one of the most abundant metals, right? Oil and coal used to be useless. Now they're incredibly useful. And we find new ways to neutralize threats from nature. So we're always expanding resources. We're always neutralizing threats. And that's how you can have it where all the experts predict the world is going to get worse and it keeps getting better. But I find it very valuable to know the philosophical ideas underneath the wrong predictions and then the right way to think about it, because it'll really make you much happier as a human to be optimistic about what freedom leads to instead of being afraid the earth is going to lose its resources and punish you, which a lot of people are afraid of. Earlier, you talked about Elon Musk being wrong on electric vehicles and wrong on batteries, but it seems like he is right on population, on the Earth's population. He said the Earth can handle billions more people. Uh, that goes against, yeah. of course, what Paul Ehrlich wrote about. I remember studying Paul Ehrlich back in college. I think his book, The Population Bomb at the time, and, um, you know, that the Earth is going to collapse under the weight of too many people. 
Uh, he was writing about this, I think, back in the 1960s, I think. And, he, you know, he's continued to write, push this idea. So what is the sort of philosophical underpinning of someone like Paul Ehrlich? And yeah, what models is he using to say, yes, the earth is going to end, population bomb, it's, everything's terrible? And then how has that evolved? Because a lot of these experts, I mean, they, they've had to evolve now because they haven't hit these doomsday numbers. So they're like having to come up with some new 10-year plan, 15-year plan yeah. to keep moving the goalpost every time. Well, part of the reason I came up with this delicate nurture assumption as this cat as this way of capturing it is it really captures the full range of things. Like if you think about it as this idea of nature is stable, safe, and sufficient, and then human beings are parasite polluters, it really captures all the variations of it. So to take the journey of somebody like Ehrlich, he was more at the beginning focused on, you know, nature gives us sufficient resources, but we can't be too greedy. So his focus was, oh, we're gobbling up the resources too quickly. Uh, but then what happens is we, and that we don't not have be a the running... And not to interrupt you, but that might not be a bad thing, right? When you look at like the cod, cod industry or whatever, and you look at how waters are totally bereft of cod in certain areas because they're overfished, right? Would that would that be reasonable? Well, yeah, but that that's almost always a property issue. So hmm. with and this is the thing is is, and this actually relates to Elon and and where I think he's right and where he's wrong. It's good to, so to give the correct view, it's good to be fundamentally optimistic about the limitless resource potential of Earth because human beings left free can always create new resources and that includes more abundant resources. So if you take things like ocean creatures that we want to eat, you know, we have unlimited potential to make the, the oceans are basically deserts. We can use what's called mariculture to create much bigger populations of all kinds of sea creatures. We can use aquaculture as a more local phenomenon. Uh, a lot of what impedes that is that these things don't have proper property rights. Uh, so what happens is if you don't have proper property rights, that's like saying, oh, well, I have a farm and everyone else is allowed to take the stuff on my farm. We're going to have scarcity. Of course, you're going to have scarcity because having abundance requires that you're always producing more than you consume which private property owners are incentivized to do, but when you have a commons, you don't. But it's just very important that you can be very optimistic about the resource potential of Earth, but that absolutely does not mean it is inevitable. And the number one thing that makes it non-inevitable is government restriction on production. And here's where I think Elon is, is a problematic character because he advocates, I mean, he's gotten better, but he's, he advocates quite a few government restrictions on production, uh, hostility toward fossil fuels, and then perhaps non-coincidentally, favoritism toward solar and batteries are, you know, are things that he uh, advocates in various ways. But when you restrain production, you you cause resource scarcity, and you can actually make these these uh, resource deprivation predictions come true. So, for example, if we're seeing this now with electricity, right? Electricity could be incredibly abundant, but it's scarce because of government restrictions on electricity production. Oil and gas around the world could be much more abundant, but we're running into different challenges with them, in part because of government restrictions. Nuclear has unbelievable potential to expand, but governments have basically criminalized it around the world, so they've prevented that. So you can think of it as there's this alternate reality where if production had been free, we'd have so much more abundant energy, so much more innovation, everything else, but it's been constrained. Well, if you constrain it two, three, four, five, ten times as much as people are advocating, then you will have this world of resource scarcity. So often resource scarcity is a self-fulfilling fallacy because it, it says resource scarcity is inevitable, so we're going to restrict production, but then you restrict production and then you get resource scarcity. And they say, see, I told you resources were scarce. It's like, no, you made resources scarce. So that's kind of the, the Paul Ehrlich version of it, the, the original one, because you're asking kind of how it evolves. When he and others got wrong, these resource scarcity predictions for a long time, then they, they shifted into something else, which they would, so they used to use this concept called carrying capacity. I mean, they still use it. So it's basically the earth can only carry so many human beings, just like a Petri dish can only carry so much bacteria. But of course, the bacteria can't produce new value. Human beings can combine their surroundings in new ways to produce new values. So it's a terrible analogy. That's how they thought of it. That started getting refuted by people like Julian Simon. I mentioned George Reisman, uh, Ayn Rand, the novelist philosopher, was really good on this issue. Then what they started saying is, we're not running out of resources. We're running out of, they'll call it like bandwidth of the earth. So they're saying like the atmosphere has limited carrying capacity. And the idea is, well, the atmosphere can only handle so much CO2 
or so much pollution, et cetera. Now, in the case of pollution, it's somewhat plausible because you know certain levels of emissions of different things, you can have bad atmospheric conditions and you want to avoid that. But of course, we can innovate to prevent that. There's no inevitability in abundance and more pollution because in fact, the more abundance you have, the more you can figure out how to not generate pollution. That's why we have you know cleaner coal, very clean natural gas, nuclear that emits nothing into the air. So th there's no inevitability, there's no unsustainability in terms of pollution. With the climate issue, it's a fallacy that there's some perfect amount of CO2 that the atmosphere can handle. I mean, there are levels you could have where we'd have trouble breathing, like if you did it more than 10 times what we have today, but we're not talking about that at all. That's not in any plausible future. So if you look at the plausible futures we have in terms of CO2, it'll mean the, tro the climate is more or less tropical, basically. That's what it means. The global climate is more or less tropical. More tropical, the more CO two you have. More That's foliage, different. More plants. Yeah. Well. That, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And and more distributed around the Earth. Right. I mean, when when the Earth gets warmer, it's mostly polar warming. So it's more that the colder regions get warm. You know, you've had many huge ice free periods. Not that we're anywhere near that, or we could get close to that. But we have you know fossils of palm trees and stuff in the Arctic areas because because like earth is often just ice free. That's a long, you know, throughout its history, it's that a long time, but that's how it works. Not the equator burns up. It's the earth as a whole becomes more uniformly tropical. So it's, it's ridiculous to think of this as the earth is ruined or something. It's different. You could say, oh, I don't want to do it or something like that. Or I'd rather, m many people would prefer it, but it's, some wouldn't, but it's, it's this idea that we're running out of bandwidth for CO2 is nonsense but just to get that i just want to answer that's how they're currently thinking of it. they're saying the atmosphere the earth hasn't run out of carrying capacity the atmosphere does but interestingly now that they've restricted production so much in the name of the atmosphere and co2 now we're starting to experience resource scarcity so now resource scarcity theory is becoming popular again <laughs> it's amazing these cycles right it, it's fascinating absolutely fascinating yeah <laughs> You know, the sources we've spoken to on the show that say we have zero point energy. We already have it. We've had it for years. The government knows about it. Um, where do you come down on that? I know it's a totally uh, separate I, I, I topic. Don't believe, I don't believe any of these things unless, like, I, I believe things where you have a continuum where you say, hey, look, like South Korea's done nuclear. You can point to cases of it working, like nuclear. South Korea is able to do it a lot more cheaply than we can. We used to do it something like 10 times cheaper. There's new technologies. Like you have enough evidence to know, okay, given the fundamentals of nuclear, you could have abundant cheap nuclear energy one way or another if you dramatically change the regulatory regime. But when people claim, you know, I have this magic thing that's not working anywhere on any scale, that's very dubious because you're basically saying no one on earth will allow me to try this thing. So I just, I'm very much evidence-based with things. And then often if I look at, I mean, people send me stuff all the time and I, I have people, anything that's plausible, I have my team look into it. And it's very sad how, how much most of this stuff checks out. I mean, someone was sending me something the other day about, I mean, it was like a pro fossil fuel thing in the sense of they want to capture, they want to use solar panels to basically create fuel out of CO2. Right. The, the idea is so you're using solar panels and then you're you're, um, you know, through through one way or another, you're taking CO2 to the atmosphere and then you're turning you're combining it with hydrogen fuel and you're some, you're making fossil fuels. But the net contribution to the atmosphere is zero. But it's like if you look at the numbers, they're talking about spending an absolute fortune to pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So it's just like, yeah, this is totally not cost effective and scalable. So either things don't work at all, or often what happens is they work in the sense of working technically, but not economically. And this is a big theme of my work is it needs to be cost effective and scalable. The fact you can do something in a lab at infinite cost or very large cost is essentially meaningless. The, unless it's an indicator that you can do it at a large scale at, at low cost. And most people, can't do that. So my, my view of anyone is I would love to see you try, but I'm not going to believe it. I'm certainly not. And in any case, the policies I advocate of energy freedom, so letting us be free to produce and consume all different forms of energy, that allows it. If you have some amazing innovation, uh, do that, but but actually do it. Don't just send me some crazy formatting, formatted email <laughs> about it. 
Right. If you do have an alien craft that you've recovered and you've been out to re- re- you know reverse engineer this this alien technology for zero point energy, send it to Alex and we will we will feature it here on the show and then he will write about it get it out there let's let's talk about yeah, it if it's if it's uh, good but actually i don't invest in it just so people know because somebody's feel like so i actually don't invest i advise a lot of politicians now so i i just don't invest in energy at all to avoid conflicts of interest so if anyone is coming to me with, for investment help I, I cannot help you on energy if you have some other good investment you can email me <laughs> i'll get you out of here on this alex which you know you talk about you're a philosopher that's where you you know you you, you buttered your bread at the beginning you were a philosopher and what was was there a moment that you that struck you that you were in some sort of an argument you were in a deep dis- philosophical discussion about energy that triggered this for you because this has led you down in a completely different path I would say but still obviously pulling from your philosophical roots here but was there a moment that said wow this is this is not what we were told and you really devoted your life to it now yeah so so for me it was it was kind of a uh... It was a set of moments, but the the basic thing was a random, pretty random thing where I was for I was teaching a course on the history of business journalism and how business journalism is really bad. And and I, I very strongly suspected that John D. Rockefeller was was mistreated by history just from the base on the basis of stuff I read. So I learned all about him. But to understand him and what he did, I needed to understand the early history of the oil industry. And from there I learned something very crucial. I learned two things actually. One is what life was like before oil, which was, you know, the countryside in Pennsylvania was dark, like life was really, really bad. And I realized, oh my gosh, there are people living like this right now because they don't have the energy both to illuminate their lives and then to do, you know, everything else that we do with machines in our lives. So that was one thing, just realizing the stark difference between having energy and not having energy and that that being a real thing to me, because I grew up in the United States, right? I didn't grow up I've been to poorer areas since then, but growing up, I wasn't in any particularly poor place. I was in the DC area. Um, And then the second thing, which was just as important, was I learned that before oil, the reason we didn't have abundant energy before oil is not because oil was the first technology on the scene, but because it was the first cost-effective technology on the scene. So it turns out that there were many other ways of illuminating homes before oil. There are different forms of what we'd call now ethanol, so plant-based, you know, alcohol fuels. There were animal fuels. People talk about, you know, whale oils, particularly sperm whale oil was the highest. But there were a bunch, there was this whole alternative energy market, but no form of energy was cost effective enough where the typical person could afford to use a lot of it. And that really made a difference in my thinking because it made me realize we don't just need energy that works technically, we need energy that works economically. And then that coupled with energy is so important to life made me realize, wow, the thinking about energy really matters because the lower cost energy is, the lower cost everything is. The higher cost energy is, the higher cost everything is. And then so, somewhat after that, I read a book called The Prize by a guy I know, I know well, know, uh, know well named Daniel Jurgen. Really, really interesting book on the history of oil. And I I read, he showed the whole history of oil was really shaped by intellectual ideas, including philosophical ideas. At least that was my interpretation. And I thought, I wish I had been around for those past debates because I disagreed with a lot of what people did. And then I thought, oh, wait, I can do that now. Like I can shape the thinking now. So I thought, well, this would be a good idea if I could shape the, the thinking, particularly the philosophy of energy which everything good depends on, and I could shape that for the better, that would be a very powerful thing uh, to do. And, and for, fortunately, you know, at the time, you don't know if you can actually do it. But fortunately, now I, I've seen a lot of progress. My thinking has absolutely evolved thanks to your work. So I thank you for that. Um, I was already sort of in your camp on this to begin with. I'm curious, have you had people who have not maybe been in that camp I would say I was mm-hmm. pretty much fully there, not fully aware of how dramatically important uh, uh, fossil fuels have been uh, to transformation, how the ease of transport, all of those things. That was eye-opening for me. But have you run across people that have read your book that were on the complete opposite side? They were one of these climate mm-hmm. alarmists. They were the King Charles pressing the button on the doomsday clock, and they've done complete reversals. And what has that been like for you? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's great because I think of it as look, I'm very interested in how do you persuade somebody who expects to disagree with you to agree with you 
I think the when, when it's somebody who's already allied, so if you take your case on this issue, I think of it as I want to turn the supporter into a champion. So I want to take somebody who, who's intellectually or emotionally inclined or both to agree. I want to give them a much better understanding of it so then they can they can exert a magnetic pull over other people. But the, the prime target is really what I call the non-supporters. So the people who expect to disagree or at least don't expect to agree, but are open to an argument. And I find that you even find those people among, I mean, we have former Greenpeace members who've become big advocates uh, of this stuff, some, some influenced by me. And then what the, the type that's very hard to influence is what I would call like a committed attacker of fossil fuels or of energy freedom. And this is somebody whose whole, either their financial, their financial livelihood depends on it, or maybe even more importantly, their psychological livelihood depends on it. So I always use the example of Al Gore. Imagine, I mean, he's both, but imagine Al Gore, even absent a financial incentive, were to read Fossil Future and have the feeling of, wow, this guy makes a lot of sense. And he actually points out a lot of things I've been pretty clearly wrong about. That's going to be really hard for him to not evade a lot of things and kind of push it away. Because what it means, and people laugh at this, but what it means, if if I'm right, it means the world would be a much better place if Al Gore had never existed. Right. Like, that's what it means. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a hard thing to accept. And now I, I, I just a random thing when I really started getting into philosophy when I was 18, I actually made a deal with myself that if I was 80 and I discovered that I had been wrong, I would admit it, even if it had meant my life was sort of harmful to the world. Well, that's like, I don't trust most people to make that commitment. And, and I, I've tried to live my life so that I don't have to ha suffer that day by correcting myself along the way. But I have seen no evidence that Al Gore has made that commitment to himself. So <laughs> I'm not trying to convince him, but I can neutralize these attackers by being very persuasive to the to the non-supporters. And that's why I highly recommend, for sure, if people want Fossil Future, get that. But then there's this website, energytalkingpoints.com. And then you can get all the new stuff at alexepstein.substack.com, including there's an AI people can try out called Alex AI, which you can ask it any question as me. And the reason I'm creating these is to allow, you know, to turn non-supporters into supporters and to turn supporters into champions. So if you if you were already inclined to agree with me, but you want to be more effective, these are tools that you can use to great effect. They're used, you know, by hundreds of political offices, lots of influencers, and that they can be used by you. And, and most of them are totally free to use. That's great. And we'll link all of that up in the description uh, below. I'll get you out of here. Final question, Alex, which I get yelled at by our viewers on a regular basis when I say fossil fuels. Because I'll mm -hmm. see we're live. We've got 30, 40,000 people watching our live show. And I'll see people say, don't call them fossil fuels. You know, it's, they're not made yeah. of fossils. They're not made of dinosaur fossils. So your book is the moral case for fossil fuels, fossil future. Yes. How do you handle people that come to you and say, Alex, they're, they're not made with fossils? Well, there are a couple forms of this argument. So the form I'm most sympathetic to is all things being equal. It would be better if we called them hydrocarbons or hydrocarbon fuels, because that's the most accurate term. They're combinations of hydrogen and carbon. And I, you know, if I could create it from scratch, I would basically have three things like SHC, LHC, and GHC. So it'd be solid. SHC is coal, like solid hydrocarbon fuel, LHC, liquid hydrocarbon fuel, and GHC is gaseous hydrocarbon fuel. And if you think about it that way, it helps a lot because actually like you can convert, you can convert like coal to oil at enough of a price, hopefully we'll be able to do it cheaply. So if you convert oil, to, if you convert coal into diesel fuel, is that coal or oil? Right. It's confusing. Right. Right. Because right. it's because it's because the net, the form that it starts in is not always the same as the form that it ends in. So uh. there, there's a bunch of confusion around it. So if you just talk about it as solid, liquid and gaseous, that would be easier. But one of the problems there, and I'm all for anyone doing this, but it, you know, when you were dealing with an issue, people have to recognize the issue. So if I had written the case, moral case for hydrocarbons, nobody would recognize that. Hydrocarbon future, nobody would recognize it. So the question for me, if I'm going to try to change a term as a primary focus is, is the term so irredeemable that I cannot use it? And this is actually true of many, many terms. I do not use the term climate change, renewable energy, sustainability, renewability. Like if you look in the book, I'm constantly disavowing terms that people use because I think they're corrupt. But fossil fuels is kind of a midway thing because what it's getting at, the fossil really kind of means old. And in that sense, 
it is mostly valid because the evidence we have, I think, is that most of what we call fossil fuels come from ancient dead life. Now, it's not dinosaurs, but it's things like plankton. It's things in the case of coal like vegetation. And it's valuable for people to understand that we we power our world and a lot of our future by this ancient dead life. And, and that's part of how we find new deposits, by the way, like oil people are using geologists who study history hundreds of millions of years ago to figure out where the next oil is going to be. So, and it's important for people to know, hey, one of the aspects is there's an enormous amount of it, but it's not quote unquote infinite. I mean, nothing is infinite, but it's valid for people to know, hey, there's not, there's not enough of this maybe to use for 10,000 years. So that doesn't mean we should restrict it today. We should just be free to use it and free to innovate and we'll be totally fine. But I think it's okay if people think of it as fossil fuels. They just have to think of it as it's hydrocarbons, high energy hydrocarbons derived from ancient dead life. Now people say, oh, it's Rockefeller that came up with the term fossil fuels to make it seem finite when it's actually infinite. I don't, I haven't seen any evidence that Roller actually did. If someone has it, they can show it to me, but make it from a real source. Don't just make it be from a political source. And then uh, I do think it's it's finite in sort of some extended sense, but it's important that we know for now that it's incredibly abundant. And that's that's the thing on the resource side. It's that we have more than 10 times more oil, coal, and natural gas uh, in their native forms underground than we've used in the whole history of civilization. So we should definitely not be abstaining from fossil fuels in the name of running out of them. The thing we need to fear is running out of freedom, because if you run out of freedom, that's when you run out of resources. Hmm. Well said. And great answer. Great answer. I'm going to use that from now on when people argue about fossil fuels. It is. Thank I mean, you. It, maybe, maybe, maybe you'll have to be, have a more concise one than I gave. But that's my No, but I love it. It makes sense right. because you have to know the argument you're having. You have to know the issue you're discussing. And most people understand fossil fuels. You, you know, you want to talk about hydrocarbon. Okay, people, yeah, most people are going to understand it. But yeah, I get it. If you're titling a book like that, no one, maybe no one would even read the book. So we know what fossil fuels are. We know that name. It's just stuck in our brain. Let's use it. Who, and we who, can redeem them. I mean, they deserve, as fossil fuels, we should be proud. I mean, we should be proud that we figured out how to use once useless ancient dead life that was doing no good for anyone. And we made life proliferate on the surface of the earth. So yeah. it's like, we should be proud of that. There's no, there's no shame in using useless quote unquote fossils to make life better. And what it's going to do is it, it creates a, a path of innovation that will then allow us to use more uranium in the form of nuclear, maybe thorium uh, for nuclear. And then who knows what we'll figure out, but you have to get there. The way you get to the energy of the future is by always using the most cost effective energy in the present. You don't get to the energy of the future by imagining that you want something else in the future, eliminating the energy of the present, becoming really poor, and then nothing happens. That, that's that's what people are advocating today in the name of being progressive. Well, fascinating. Well, I, for one, have learned quite a bit today. And uh, and like I said, I was fairly aligned with you on all of these on these issues, um, but just uh, really eye opening. And I hope our audience found this illuminating as well. Hope if you did, please share this, send this to somebody who is a maybe a climate climate alarmist skeptic um, who could use uh, some education on this. And I encourage you, we'll have links to um, energytalkingpoints.com, alexepstein.substack.com, also in the in the comments below, in the description box below, and we'll link to your, your books. I highly encourage you guys to go out there and read um, any one of your books. They're, they're fantastic. Alex, great to have you here on the show. We really appreciate your time. Thanks, Clayton. It was awesome.